Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, this channel is doomed! Doomed! Welcome to Void Star Lab, where we print, solder, and code the future like 80% of the way, then get bored and move on to something else. Void Star Lab is, as previously mentioned, doomed! The Optagon, the thing that I'm wearing right now, is my wearable teleprompter, and without it, I can't you know, do my scripts. I would forget all the wordplay, I'd screw up the facts, and I would have an impossible time delivering entertainment entertaining enough to, like, go head-to-head -head with literally everyone on Earth with a camera. There's no Little League in YouTube. It's the World Series from day one, and I can't play ball without the Optagon juicing me up. The Optagon is my Balco. It's too bad that I built it out of ancient hardware and my sketchy hacks are coming apart at the seams, making this thing a head-mounted sword of Damocles ready to drop at any second and decapitate the channel. A few months ago, I had the rare opportunity to get top-of-the-line parts that may allow me to build a next-generation Optagon of my dreams. I have really nerdy dreams. You might guess that I'm an early adopter, given all the, you know, but you would guess wrong. I'm the kind of person who waits for years for reviews to roll in and cheap devices to start popping up on eBay. But we're in a pandemic that's also a chip shortage and also a trade war. So when the perfect display and computer presented themselves, I went mad with power and sniped over over $2,000 of cutting edge hardware. Today we're going to hook it up, pray that the magic smoke stays on the inside of the chips, and perhaps avert certain doom. Or we fail and the channel dies. It's a surprise! The original headset was released in early 2014, over seven years ago as of this video, and it is such a dinosaur that when it first launched, Skillshare classes still took place in real-life face-to-face meat space. Nowadays, Skillshare gives you unlimited access to thousands of professionally produced ad-free how-to videos so you can discover something new anywhere the web is surfable. Learn at your own pace with brief bite-sized beginner-friendly tutorials, then put your new skills to work with hands-on projects. For instance, you can learn how to craft gourmet chocolate in this crash course by the founders of Rocka Chocolate. They'll show you how to concoct custom confectionaries and infuse them with a world of wild flavors and they will do it right now for free. Here's the first 1,000 viewers to hit the link in the description. That's it right there on screen right now. Get a month of Skillshare Premium on the house. Skillshare sponsored this episode if I didn't make it clear enough. Did I mention that this is $2,000 of parts? But Skillshare really did launch with live classes, not videos. The early 2010s New York City startup scene was a trip, man. So here I am, having staked my entire career on a slapdash, jank-ass face computer that debuted less than six weeks after Stardust Crusaders. The connectors are coming loose, the wires are wearing through, the trackpad stopped tracking, the battery barely lasts six hours, and the whole thing is held together with zip ties, heat shrink, and pure spite. And get this. It runs Android 4.4, nearly a decade old at this point. Only the most derelict apps are going to run, and who knows how long their APIs are going to stay up. I did an episode on the Optagon a while ago. I slapped a little more life into it by upgrading the enclosure and making some repairs. But it's been another hard year of hardware, and my hard-worn hardware has me too nervous to even touch a screw. I am pretty particular in what I want in a wearable. The display must be transparent looking in and looking out. It needs to be a monocle. And of course, all the apps that I need to do my big boy business, which probably means like Android. I know people think less of me for not like compiling things from source on Linux or writing programs myself. And I, look, I read your comments, then I look at all the work I'm falling behind on, I look at my puppy that loves me, and I have to shoo him out of the workshop yet again so I can stay up alone till 4.30 capturing B-roll of little plastic boats. When my eyes aren't pointing the same direction anymore, I curl up into a little ball under my workbench and rock back and forth trying to cry, but too hollow inside to register anything but a vague looming sorrow. It's a living. But then I got an email from Epson, their brand new Moverio BT-40 head launch. That's four generations ahead of the BT-200. To my path logically miserly ass, dumping over 1200 bucks on brand new tech sight unseen is physically painful, but if you watch the first Optagon episode, then you know what happened the last time I didn't impulse buy a heads-up display. On paper, the Moverio BT-40 is perfect. The BT-200 has backlit LCDs at 960 by 540 for some reason, but the BT-40 packs OLEDs, no backlight required, at 1080p full HD. Remember that we are talking about area here. It's not twice the resolution, that's four times the resolution. The BT-200's field of view, that is the angle that your arms would make if you point at diagonal corners of the picture, is a pretty respectable 23 degrees. But the BT-40 is a massive 34. Even this interface intended for a television is crystal clear on the BT-40. 
But it's not all sunshine and rainbows, because in the land of hardware, the best case scenario is mild disappointment. Even though the BT40's lens is about two-thirds the height of the BT200, that means it's smaller, the optics package is about the same size and they weigh almost the same. The new Optagon is not going to look or feel much different than the one I'm wearing right now, but the other end of that cable is another story. Instead of a crappy headless Android box or stupid battery-powered receiver, there's nothing but a USB Type-C cable. That's right, this thing gets its power and its video through a single USB Type-C connector. This right here is why electrical engineers close their eyes during sex. DisplayPort is a video transfer standard like HDMI. It's published by Visa, the veiny brain Sigma Chads, who decreed that all monitors shall be mounted with a 75mm square of M4 screws. Visa published the DisplayPort alternate mode on USB Type-C connector standard in 2014, and nothing says intercompatibility like an optional off-spec standard that dynamically rewires the physical layer at runtime. Here's how it works. You plug the display into a thing, the display offers up a secret handshake, and if the thing is hip to the jazz, the two reroute a few signal lines to carry video instead of daters. The BT40 didn't work with my LG G5, although the LG G5 has this feature, because f*** you. It does play nice with the wife East Galaxy Active, but Brooke needs that to text her boyfriend. That got me thinking, is there a single board computer with a Type-C display port? The Latte Panda, the Nvidia boards, you do, Orange Pi, and many, many others have display port or the super sexy embedded display port built in. But hark, through yonder AliExpress window breaks the Kadas. Kadas. Kadash. Kadas. Kadas Kat, I win. Edge V. The single board computer is equipped with the powerful rock chip RK3399, which has a dual core and a quad core CPU, hardware GPU, and interfaces out the wazoo. And not only does it have two USB Type C ports, one of them is also a display port. I've never heard of this brand before, I still don't know how to pronounce it, but I was drinking at the time, so I pulled the trigger and vaporized another 800 bucks of my patrons' money on a pile of Edge Vs and Edge V accessories. The, the Hadass Edge V is a seriously stacked single board computer. In addition to the pair of Type-C ports, you get two regular ass Type-A ports, HDMI, Gigabit Ethernet, dual antenna Wi-Fi with honest-to-god antennas, Bluetooth 5, 4 gigs of RAM, and 32 gigabytes of onboard flash preloaded with Android 9. And get this, a mother-lovin' infrared blaster, Palm Pilot Game Boy style, the Madman! Accessories include a LiPo charge controller that's definitely going into this project, an M2 expansion board that definitely is not, an LCD display, I know what I did, an infrared remote control and heat sinks, active and passive. A passive heat sink on this thing is very optimistic, because even at idle, the Edge V gets hotter than your mom looked that time I took her on that nice dinner cruise. The conversation was nice, but there was still chemistry, you know? Now for the moment of truth. I will plug the BT40 into the Edge V, power it up, drum roll please, Forty years of darkness, the dead rising from their graves, dogs and cats living together, all of these are infinitely more likely than two components working together on the first try. Yet here we are. It's working! It's working! The new system is incomparably faster and infinitely easier on the eyes, and oh my god, it's got the Play Store pre-installed. Did I mention that I had to sideload the App Store on the Optagon and spoof the device ID so Google thinks it's a Nexus 7 just to download the teleprompter app using a trackpad on a one-eyed video headset? The final step is to verify that we can mod the BT40 to be a monocular. If we can't yeet that right eye display, this is a dead end because I gotta have this eye free for eyebrow purposes. The BT200's frame had a channel to route a cable between the eyepieces, and it didn't care if one or both displays were unplugged. I don't even think it could tell. The BT40 doesn't have a frame at all, yet there's only one cable for two displays, so either Epson has invented invisible wires, or this black decal on top is actually a self-adhesive ribbon cable. Hold my quagsire, I'm going in. Quagsire! This is what the left side display pod looks like on the inside. We've got the optics assembly in black, the micro display is mounted at the rear, the bottom board is a display driver, and the top is some kind of motherboard that distributes video and stuff to all the displays. The BT40's internals are actually bulkier than the BT200, probably because some of the circuitry had to be moved from the computer Android unit into the headset itself. The lapel clip thing is also bigger, again, probably full of thinking lightning rocks. Don't worry, we're gonna have an excuse to bust this open soon. Don't worry, stop worrying! 
It looks like this one flat flex cable connects the upper motherboard to both sides display boards, so at some point we're going to have to slice and dice this to convert this to a monocle. For testing though, we can just pop open the right side display and unplug it. With the right side disconnected, we'll power up the Edge V to see if the left side still works. Oh no! Moverio knows the display is offline and it's refusing to turn on. Let's do some experiments. I'm booting it up with both displays connected, but I'm going to pop off the right hand side once it's already displaying a picture, and the left side shuts off. What's weird is that when I plug it back in, both eyepieces start up again. That's really bad. You'd think that cutting something in half would be the easy part. Let's grab our calabash pipes, put on our tweed hats, and snoop for clues around the circuit boards. The video fun clearly starts here. This Analogix ANX7580 receives the DisplayPort video stream and converts it to the MyPi display serial interface to drive the, you guessed it, cameras. Nah, no, I'm just kidding. It's the displays. I doubt this could be the culprit. MyPi DSi does have a bi-directional mode, but it's usually used to directly drive display panels, and as you're going to see, there's another layer of abstraction in between. Either way, I can't tell for sure because this part's data sheet is confidential. I doubt Analogix would even call 911 if I was bleeding out in front of their headquarters. Up here we have an STM32 F446 microcontroller that runs at a pretty zippy 180 megahertz. It's located under the headphone jack and it's got digital analog converters and audio interfaces and stuff. So I'm guessing this thing's main job is to drive headphones and capture audio from the mic. Still, if the missing display is being detected by code, this chip is likely to be running. Running it. Moving up the cable to the headset itself, this motherboard connects to the lapel clip and sends video signals to both display boards. This right here is the main attraction, a spicy Lattice MD6000 FPGA featuring MyPi physical layer IP blocks. It, it doesn't run code per se, although you do program it. It's more like a pile of logic gates, blocks of circuits, and other mini components, and the code physically wires them together into a custom chip. This right here could be causing a problem as it's the first thing the display boards talk to. Both display drivers are copies of the same board, and uh, the main thing on each of them is a weaker FPGA. It's got three FPGAs in it. FPGAs, Brooke. There's got to be some sort of data flowing back from the display driver to the motherboard. It could be as simple as shorting one of the socket's pins to ground so the line goes high when it's unplugged. Or the system might be sending an are you still there message every second or so, and if it doesn't get a response in a certain amount of time, it panics. The worst case scenario is that it's actually expecting constant communication using a bi-directional protocol. And that would suck! For now, this is as far as I'm going to go. These parts are too small to probe, and I can only plug and unplug these mezzanine connectors about a dozen times before they break. Next step is to design some breakout boards that go in between these connectors so I can probe the signals. Hopefully, keeping the left display on will be as simple as shorting a detect line to ground, but we may need to do a more involved hack. The driver boards don't have any jumpers to indicate which one's the left side and which one's the right side. I might be able to just pipe the left side's output to the right side, so that dumbass processor thinks the right side is still attached because the processor's a chump. The decision is really whether to sink more time into finding a workaround or cutting my losses, ditching the BT40 and trying a different display. The odds of Epson helping me out here round up to 0%, but if there is an easy workaround, I should be able to find it within a couple of days of tinkering. I really like this display, so I think it's worth a gamble. So I will see you on stream some Monday or Friday at noon Mountain Time, 1700 UTC, twitch.tv slash Zach Friedman, as I bash my head against reverse engineering a heads-up display. I'm going to suffer for your amusement, and you're going to love it. As for the Edge V, I'm pretty satisfied with it. I think it's good to go right out of the box. Uh, the next step is to experiment with powering it from Canon camera batteries so I can run Optagon 2 Wear Boogaloo from the same lithium packs as the very black magic camera I'm filming with. No more forgetting to charge the heads-up display, which happens literally every time we film, including this time. Now I'll just be able to swap mags. Please let me know what you thought of this episode. I feel kind of guilty making a video without finishing the project first, but this thing is months from done. And I just thought you folks might find the early stages interesting. Uh, if you want to be reminded when that finally happens, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell. And privileged YouTubers, just assuming everyone's got a phone. It's sick, Brooke. It's sick. Remember to use the link in the description to get your first month of Skillshare for free and tell them that I sent you. But sponsorships didn't come close to covering this project. This one is all about the patrons. My phenomenally philanthropic collaborators are Vinayaka Patrick Thompson, Jeremy Arnold, Schweddy Veg, Brian D. Swollen Nut. Regan says, 
Execute Order 66. Chuck Faduk Small Dong Command and introducing the supremely generous Evan Schechtman. I've hidden their names in this episode, like I really hope there's a secret set of debug commands Epson's developers forgot to comment out of the firmware. But who could forget our absurdly altruistic and truly absurd lab assistant supporters? This guy. That's what the Optagon is for. These people, if I may be so bold, includes Bob Dobbington, Ethan Gomes, TKMK, Lydia K, Zoster, Nathan Johnson, Sir Dupington of Dubtopia, C. Harris, Curb, Bill Schooler, Erlab Brussels, Nino Gansitano, Epunman, Period Clots, Eddie, Ashley Coleman, Zach, the Antifa, Burbasser did nothing wrong yet. Philip, Talon, Democratic Socialist, and a pretty righteous dude. Varka, a Yiddish mama, good suck. Caster the Catboy, it's 2021, I still go to My Little Pony conventions. Chronome, followed by a bunch of bullshit. Burun Duck 3, Kevin DeGraff, the world's second greatest drone pilot. Sanforian Achilles, always remember, but I forgot what. The Midnight Patron, what patrons at midnight. Michael Roche, Boulder Creek Yard, James. One handful of beans. A Zundo, Clungebob, Squirt, Pants, Rusty Flute. My Dog is a Bear, a Blade of Kitten, Duck Distribution Specialist, and a Choir of Stickers. Trans writes the Cuttlefish. Protagonist, Frantic Fanatic, BLM and Friends, Victor Vaughn, Joe Harp, Granville Schmidt. On all levels except physical, I am a lioness. The world's greatest drone pilot, Bachrander FPV, Rolando Alvarez, Arrow Raider, Powerful CCH, Taranac, Katz, Aiden P, Brad Cox, SXP, William Drescher, and fellow ride or die glasshole, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater. People are going to ask why I insisted on building a wearable teleprompter instead of just buying a teleprompter that attaches to the camera. Bless their hearts. I'll see you in the future.